Welcome to The Forgotten, a member of Episodic Network. Season 2, Episode 7, The Leap into Politics. It has been quite a while since I've recorded an episode. To cut this short, I had a lot of personal trouble, as well as my scheduled leaving of the German army and some minor medical issues, but I'm still alive and kicking. Now I got the time, sanity and the will to restart this podcast. If you check out the website, you'll be able to see a roadmap of this year. For this second season, I will refrain from releasing the episodes every Monday, but I will fire them out as soon as they are finished, so that I will be able to conclude this series by the end of the month. It's gonna be a lot of work, but I'm pretty positive that I'll manage. As you might have already noticed, I recently joined a podcasting network, the Episodic Network, started fairly recently by the producer of the awesome Our of History podcast, James Orbel, and the host of this magnificent show, Steve Borman. If detailed analyses of both recent and not-so-recent matters of political and historical importance are your thing, and I very much hope they are, this podcast is a real treasure for you. Be sure to check the network out under www episodicnetwork.com. Alas, let's come back to the topic which I have postponed so far. Joe Kennedy, by this time self-made millionaire and father of eight, his to this point youngest daughter and still living offspring, Jean Anne, being born in 1928 in his absence, had achieved his first life goal. None of his children would ever have to work for a living. The Kennedy family affairs appear to be in order. Jack, the future president, Developed quite well given his sickly disposition, something that would improve even more as he attended boarding school, Choate School in Wallisford, Connecticut, where the headmaster and his wife made it their personal endeavor to beef up the still somewhat skinny boy by feeding him excessive amounts of home-cooked food. Whatever modern nutritionists might say about this, it worked. Joe, who would graduate from the same school in 1933, was a bright student who would then go to the alma mater of his old man, Harvard. Rosemary, his daughter, suffered from the complications she had to endure at birth. While the accounts of mental retardation are far from 100% proven, as already mentioned before, she had serious problems at school, something that only the immediate family knew and was a well-guarded secret for pretty much all her life. She apparently had improved quite a lot during her visit at the Pennsylvania boarding school for the mentally feeble, in Devereux, starting in fall 1929. It was argued by experts that the devotion and love Joe's wife Rose felt and expressed to her, and I can't stress enough that this is a quote, mentally retarded and slow child was only exacerbating the problem, as it both only drew the attention from the normal children to the odd one out, and did not prepare poor young Rosemary for the harshness of a world that was by far not as inclusive as the 21st century is. Sources unanimously state that she was an extremely kind and friendly young girl, so far as to report on her progress stating that she exhibited, quote, excellent social poise, with quite some artistic talent, and her arithmetic and literary skills developed quite well. The headmasters, however, agreed on one point. The young girl was extremely shy and introverted and needed lots and lots of praise and affection to actually do something. Something which was not the educational goal in the harsh realities of the 20th century. Especially in English lessons, she, quote, dislikes making the effort necessary to attain good results. Joe Kennedy, however grease-stricken he might have been by this, apparently gave his best to encourage his daughter to push on, as some of his letters to her show. I cannot tell how excited and pleased I was to get your letter. I think you were a darling to write me so soon, are the opening words of a letter he wrote to her in early 1930. Reading about this, I must admit, makes me shake my head every time, remembering the horrible fate poor Rosemary had to suffer by the hands of her family. The marriage situation of the Kennedys is cause for some debate to this day. With Joe, the notorious adulterer, and his pious wife, there were most certainly enough reasons for trouble. Whether she knew about Swanson, something she vehemently opposed to her deathbed, or not, it is still quite obvious that both had quite a different view on fidelity in the marriage bed. A Washington Post article from 1987 
quite a long while after Joe's death, depicts a scene from a party where Joe tried to convince her of his ways. Or, to quote the article, Now, listen, Rosie, he would say to her, his blue eyes twinkling. This idea of yours that there is no romance outside of procreation is simply wrong. It was not part of our contract at the altar. The priest never said that, and the books don't argue that. And if you don't open your mind on this, I'm going to tell the priest on you. But, according to Mary Green, Rose remained firm in her beliefs, and years later, after her last child was born, she simply said, no more sex. From then on, she and Joe had separate bedrooms. Such a fundamental dispute over the role of sexual intercourse in human relationships probably would have been a test to any marriage, hadn't Joe had his many sexual conquests to enjoy his day with. Undoubtedly, however, as I already mentioned in episode 6, most of his biographers and I agree that those were sex-only relationships, and his loyalties most certainly were with Rose and Rose only. To illuminate the Kennedys' further family life, which did very much intensify in the early 30s, we have to take a look at his business dealings. After the smashing success that was The Trespasser, Joe did see that the movie business was not the place where he wanted to re-establish himself after the disaster that was Queen Kelly. The desperate attempt to once again save this disaster in November 1929, in which he even got the world-famous composer of Die Lustige Witwe, The Merry Widow, Franz Leha, to compose the music was in vain. Nobody cared to make the necessary investment of a few hundred thousand more dollars, after Kennedy had already lost around eight hundred thousand dollars, to basically make an entirely new movie, especially not Joe. In March 1930, Queen Kelly would be finally shelved, with Kennedy laying down management of Gloria Productions, Gloria Swanson's production team, in June. According to Nassau, his creative bookkeeping had left him rich and her poor. He showed his shares in the Pathé Studios on May 7, 1930. So, by the time he stopped all those activities, he was no longer involved in the movie industry. Even if you do not consider yourself a so-called history buff, you will probably know that 1929 and 1930 were not exactly brilliant years for the US economy and the world economy in general. Since the events of the Black Thursday on October 24, 1929, the once virtually indestructible economy of the United States crashed down like a house of cards. The deepest low was only reached in 1932, so you can imagine that anything happening in this era was a time of cataclysmic events, the devaluation of trillions of dollars of capital and savings and the death of hundreds, if not thousands, great and small banks and businesses throughout the states alone. Only a small handful of businessmen managed to weather this storm unscathed, and the most prominent one, one who even made gains during the crisis years, was Joseph Patrick Kennedy Sr. How's that possible, you may ask? If you came here for a definitive answer, well, I and every historian in the world will probably have to disappoint you. There simply is none. Joe just did about everything that could be done right. Whenever he bought short options, the share prices dropped, to an extent where shares he bought of US Steel in early 1931 lost more than three quarters of their value by early 1932. He managed several accounts, a few of his own, several for still kicking little banks and businesses, as well as some in the name of his wife and children. All of this might appear as a story of incredible financial prowess, but it is Quite certain that not all of his deals were something the light of God should shine upon. Indeed, Joe made a fortune of a practice that is called insider trading. This means that he personally knew very important information about certain stocks and bonds that gave him a head start to any other trader. He did not only possess such information, however, he fabricated quite a lot of it too. So-called bear raids, meaning combined sales of certain stocks together with many of his business partners, causing a significant drop in prices and resulting in the effectiveness of his short positions, press campaigns and other fabricated information caused even more havoc on the market, expanding his profits more and more. Ironically, Joe himself would make these practices illegal when he became chairman of the SEC. It is assumed that, in early 1932, he had gained $4 million, a whopping $60 million in today's currency, from his strategic investments alone. He was not blind for the problems of the time, however. He did very much see the pressing problem of this disastrous era. 
His biographer, David Nasor, quotes his memoirs that he had felt and said, I would be willing to part with half of what I had if I could be sure of keeping, under law and order, the other half. Then it seemed that I should be able to hold nothing for the protection of my family. Nasor analyzes this utterance quite profoundly. The spectre of communism was probably giving Kennedy and the people of his stature more than only mild headaches. While, from the retrospective, it seems most unlikely that the few communist organizers back in the day might have been able to start anything like the communist revolutions in Petrograd, Berlin and many other European cities, back in the day none of that seemed quite as certain. So, in 1932, he retired from active trading and instead removed himself into trading with lots and lots of real estate. It might have been less lucrative, but it most certainly withdrew him from public attention and especially the attention of hordes of poor, unemployed and hungry workers who might have easily found someone to blame for their misery. His financial affairs, in sound order, he discovered both old and new field of exercise, politics. In Hostage to Fortune, the collection of his letters, quite early in the book, you can find a letter from none other than Franklin Delano Roosevelt to Joe Kennedy. They had been acquainted before, when Joe was the manager of the Four River plant during the First World War, FDR was a Navy secretary, although it is more than certain that Kennedy, at this point, was well under Roosevelt's radar. In 1928, however, he made first contact with a shrewd and popular businessman on behalf of his bosses, Al Smith's presidential campaign. While Kennedy, as you might remember, while Kennedy, as you might remember, still a member of the Democrats, supported President Hoover, the Republican candidate in this run, and Roosevelt's pleas for assistance, quote, I sincerely hope you will let me know frankly and confidentially where you stand, apparently fell on deaf ears. It appears that Kennedy was still intrigued by the young and willful man who differed from him in so many ways. Why did Kennedy support the Republicans, you may ask? He just thought that Hoover was the better candidate and superior to Smith, which, in the long run, is rather debatable. Furthermore, he was still rather bitter over his father's and his father-in-law's defeat almost 20 years ago and had a profound dislike for the antics of Smith and his entourage. According to Nassau, Joe and FDR were completely different characters. While Kennedy was a staunch Catholic, Roosevelt was as much a staunch Protestant. While Kennedy came from a rather modest background, Roosevelt had been born and raised a classical American old blood, basically a nobleman who had known nothing but wealth for his entire life and was raised with a certain sense of importance and privilege. Yet, following his line of thought, both of them were charmers. Both of them knew exactly how to get the opposite to do what they wanted to do, something which actually worked for Roosevelt even when talking to Kennedy, resulting in a little mismatch in favors during their partnership. Nonetheless, it wasn't only loyalty to his party that made Joe support the Democrat, but also his own interests. It was Roosevelt who Joe thought might be able to turn the tide in the battle against depression and as such would ensure that Joe's finances and the social situation would remain stable. He might easily have been a liability to the democratic campaign for two reasons. The American aristocracy viewed him as something of a traitor to his own kin as most of his friends from business and the gentlemen's clubs all over the US were republicans by choice especially because the mainstay of President Hoover's second campaign was to solve the Great Depression by giving the wealthy freedom of action so that they might help the crisis heal itself. Roosevelt, on the other hand, argued that only a concerted effort by the government might be able to fend off the crisis and mend the growing rift in American society, something which the common man found much more enticing. This common man, however, was the second problem. Kennedy's wealth and his success during the years of the Depression were however hard he tried to remove himself from the stage, well known through the entire country, and taking one of the big money sacks aboard might have hurt the campaign more than Kennedy could support it in the eyes of the working class. Even most Irish Democrats and voters would probably rather have seen Al Smith run a second time, but Kennedy was one of the loudest supporters of FDR, a man he thought to have the prowess and strength to shoulder the gigantic task of reinvigorating the US economy. Kennedy, however, had one big trump card on his side. He was very well acquainted to a Californian who went by the name of William Randolph Hearst, one of the most powerful publicists in America, let alone the entire world, 
whose yellow press papers were read by hundreds of millions of Americans per week. The first few attempts to get Hearst to support FDR in the primaries failed. Once Roosevelt was the elected candidate, after Hearst had convinced his pet candidate, John Nance Garner, to abandon his claim on the presidential race at the very last minute at the Democratic National Convention on July 1st, the propaganda machinery of the Hearst Empire started firing its shells for the campaign, probably leaving a distinct impact on the outcome of this presidential race. Garner became Roosevelt's running mate. Kennedy became a more and more important figure in the 1932 campaign. Kennedy's importance for the campaign grew, something which he might have achieved by greatly embellishing his personal friendship with Roosevelt, of which he claimed to have been a friend for almost 15 years since he was the manager of an important naval yard. After the decisive convention, according to Nassau, Hearst went on to claim all the glory of Roosevelt winning the nomination for him, while Kennedy took his fair share for bringing Hearst to support him. The campaigning break in the summer of 1932 led to Joe having quite a lot of time for his family affairs. In 1928, as mentioned in the last episode, the Kennedy family moved into a new mansion, basically an improved and expanded version of the Huyannisport house. The beautiful 800 square meters house on Cape Cod offered everything both the parents and their offspring could hope for. In this summer of 1932, Joe spent the entire season at home and indulged in the many activities he did not have time for before. Joe Jr. quickly became fond of the sea, and the head of the family made sure that all of the kids old enough would learn sailing from their eldest brother. Joe Sr. would love to go riding with all of his children. An anecdote tells that he, angry over the high fees for lending the horses at a local stable, he decided to buy the entire thing for $18,000 later stating that it was the best real estate deal of his entire life. He played hours and hours of golf on a nearby course. He spent lots of time just relaxing, meeting friends at the local gentleman's club, which he had to bail out of its financial misery first, and in general, that we can assume, had a pretty great time. In September, however, the campaigning season started again. Joe joined the campaign train of Roosevelt in Salt Lake City, Utah, and went on to cross the entire country with it. Jefferson City, St. Louis, Kansas City, Topeka, and many more stations. According to several of his biographers, Joe was having the time of his life. It appears that he greatly enjoyed the thrill of bathing in the masses, which Roosevelt started to attract more and more the longer they traveled. He actively helped in designing speeches, and, I'm sure you're not surprised, he and the entire entourage stayed in the fanciest hotels and ate the best food. It became obvious quickly that Joe had backed the right horse, as the entire country, of course assisted by Hearst's press, quickly rallied behind the Democratic candidate. The September tour, however, seemed to be the only one he would join. The second, well better known tour through the Midwest started without him on October 18th. Although his exploits at the first tour were probably not to be underestimated, Joe Kennedy was someone who did not really fit into the image of this presidential campaign. Furthermore, he was politically inexperienced. Instead, he did what he could do best, fundraising. At least that was what Roosevelt thought he could do best. Joe himself had only contributed around approximately $172,000 in our currency, and he gave the campaign a loan of $50,000, which he expected to be paid back in full. This did not impress Roosevelt and his advisors too much. His luck and direct connection to Roosevelt came back on rather dubious ways. William Randolph Hearst decided that it was too risky to dedicate any money to the campaign of FDR himself, who many deemed someone too radical and internationalist. Putting your own press on FDR's side was one thing, he was still the Democratic candidate, but personally financing his campaign would be something else entirely. Hearst decided that it would be best to funnel the funds through someone of the candidate's entourage, and Kennedy seemed just like the right man. In a letter he sent to Hearst on October 19th, one day after receiving $25,000 for a radio campaign, which were to be paid in his name, Joe wrote, I appreciate personally, more than I can ever express to you, your kindness in mailing it to me because I realize that this check coming to the committee through me helps a great deal in having consideration paid to any suggestions that I might want to make. 
You may rest assured, and this I want to say in order to go on record, that whenever your interest in this administration is not served well, my interest has ceased. This Blankoscheck, to use the term for the unlimited support given to Austria by Emperor William II in 1914, was meant to assure Hearst that Kennedy would be the most staunch defender of Hearst's interests in the government. Furthermore, it shows how even the grassroots campaign of Roosevelt was still influenced by some of the big guys on top, and that, based on this logic, they expected to have a distinct measure of control on the coming administration. Hearst, however, would not be able to benefit from Roosevelt's presidency, and Kennedy's quick promise of loyalty would come back to bite him sooner than he expected. This particular investition, however, brought Kennedy back into the game. Five days after this incident, Joe received a telegram from none other than FDR himself, currently on the second campaign train through the Midwest, saying, Been having a great trip, stop. Why don't you join up with us at Richmond, Washington or Baltimore, and... Hearst's investment and another donation of $5,000 of his own money quickly brought Kennedy back to the fold, much to the disappointment of Lewis Howe, Roosevelt's most trusted advisor and probably the one responsible for kicking him off the second campaign train in the first place. Howe and Kennedy would share a lifetime of animosity. It would be far-fetched to suggest that Kennedy was now a mole in the entourage of the future president, or something like Hearst's lapdog, but he did understand very well how to use this unexpected gift from one of the most powerful men in America to his advantage, and he probably believed that he would be given an important position in the new cabinet. November 8, 1932, saw the landslide victory of the Democratic candidate Franklin Delano Roosevelt, winning with 57.4% of the popular vote. 472 of the electors voted for him, only 59 for Hoover, and he carried 42 out of the 48 states of the Union at this time. It was done. Joe Kennedy, son of a failed local political Irish boss of Boston, had helped to bring a president of the United States into the office. Next time, we will jump into the somewhat chaotic construction of the Roosevelt cabinet, Joe's role in it, and his service to the United States. It's gonna be a roller coaster of emotions for him. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and I wish you a good day or a good night. See you next time. <laughs>